Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast. Steve Palazzolo back here with Mike Renner for our draft show of the week. We apologize for bringing it in on a Friday instead of a Thursday, but a hectic week with um, with interviews, Mike. Yes. I didn't get the uh, Bengals draft. Yeah, a few rounds I heard you made it through, yeah. but it's not... N- if you're not first, you're last, apparently. So Wow. No one's going to ever know. They said it was close. Yeah. And um, I thought I made a good pitch right here on the PFF NFL podcast earlier in the week for what I would do as Bengals defensive coordinator. But as they say, you know, they, the experience. They need to have like a Rooney rule for analytics people. Yes. Yeah, you got you to interview one analytics person every hire. Or that's else a great call. Help. Just like somebody who's completely unqualified mm-hmm. like me. You have to get him in the mix there. Um, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's disappointing, but the experience was great. And I think that'll do me well yep. next time I'm going for another position that I'm completely unqualified for. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. But for now, I'm back. Um, I lost a little leverage in my PFF contract negotiation. <laughs> um, but we'll try to find some other options. I, I, I'll help you out, Steve. You need a recommendation for that. I'll gladly. You need. Are there any modeling options? I think <laughs> I might be able to put that in front of Neil as... Another opportunity. Uh, is that secretive or is that... What secretive? Your your modeling career. I don't know what you're talking about, Steve, so I guess it is secretive. You know Instagram's public, right? <laughs> I do. I saw some pictures. I was featured on an account with over 1.2 million followers, Steve, so no big deal. Do you want to talk about it? For, no, you I'd, a, I'd rather This seconds. is a football podcast, Steve. Let's get back. Because for draft. a minute there, we had a, a text exchange with a few of our other colleagues and we couldn't figure out if you eloped or if you were modeling it was that uh it's good time yeah it was great there's good picks so you're not married no it's good to know um text message from somebody who didn't mean to text me Mm. about that okay uh we're not going to talk about bob Kraft today we're going to talk draft let's go um so what we did just this morning mike we went through Mm-hmm. put together the pff top 50 our initial top 50 on the draft board we're always kind of revamping this thing it's not strictly based off the grades the grades uh influence it quite a bit our eyeballs influence it quite a bit and and essentially um we're evaluating players trying to see what we think they're going to do at the nfl level the grades are a huge component of it because we, now we have more and more data to rely upon and say okay look he's good in this area not good in this area mm-hmm. Um, we do take positional value into account. So I think in our board, um, you're going to see maybe quarterbacks. So we don't love the quarterbacks, so they're not going to be that high. But if we have to decide between a quarter, a, qu- a quarterback and maybe a tackle, we'll, we'll take the QB. Yes, we're going to be higher on them because of they're just so much more valuable. They are, and, and they're, they're worth the risk. And um, corners are going to be a little bit higher if we really like them as well. So uh, the board isn't out until... Uh, early next week but let's discuss some of the things um some of the places where maybe we differ okay from the rest of maybe the draft world so let's start with our number one player let's let's discuss the debate at the top okay we decided on kyler murray yes at number one i truthfully we decided on it i compromised the kyler murray at number one because it's in my mind so i look at it like this if you're going to take a quarterback highly you better feel confident that he's a franchise guy and not just a franchise guy i think you have to think he's capable of top five top ten you know not yeah. not kirk Cousins sort of play not that be not that step below where it's good but i think you want a guy who can carry you to a super bowl for my money kyler murray has those sort of traits and especially when you factor in his running ability i don't see Dwayne haskins for me he caps out in that tier below, right. which at that point, then I'm not putting him at the top of my big board. Right. I, I don't see him being that guy. I think he can very well be in the Kirk Cousins range. I could foresee him being that sort of quarterback, which, again, has a ton of value. That's why he drafted highly. But to me, if you're a quarterback that is capable of being in that upper upper echelon of QBs, that's when you can go number one. That's when you're that's number one in our big board. Yeah, so again, from an, from an eval standpoint, the guys that are two and three on this list, we feel better about them as players. Yes. From a value standpoint, Kyler Murray is our number one QB on the board. He's going to be, uh, nothing's going to change in that regard. The numbers are pointing toward him uh, being the top quarterback. Our eyeballs, uh, whether it's Zach Robinson, his um, you know opinion on it, or you know everyone else around the company. Not saying it's consensus, but you know we feel pretty good about yes. Kyler Murray. Not as good as Baker Mayfield, but feel good about him at number one. Tell me about two or three. And then two and three, Nick Bosa, Quinn and Williams. For in, for me, 
for them to bust, for them to not live up to and be at least high quality starters at the NFL level, injuries, it would have to be injury wise or something off the field completely. They're on field. I have absolutely zero questions about them translating to the next level, being successful NFL players. At that point, that's why they're two and three. Any player, regardless of position, if you were that to me, you would be two or three, maybe not running back. So the confidence level and what they're going to do at the next level is uh, extremely high. Mm -hmm. Um, especially given what we've seen from our defensive line grades. Bosa has been an elite defensive lineman in our grades. Quinnen Williams had the best grade we've ever seen from an interior defensive lineman, so we feel good Mm -hmm. about those two guys. Um, Let's go to where... So Kyler's the first one where we really differ from the consensus. Give me some other names. What are some other guys that we feel better about than maybe the general consensus out there? Well, at number 11, checked in Jerry Tillery defensive tackle that's a big one. Notre Dame and yeah that's a big one uh being a top 12 sort of talent in this draft class above any of uh only Jeffrey Simmons and Quinn Williams were higher on our defensive tackle list and Simmons we obviously are saying he tore his ACL early we think he could even come back as a rookie with how early he tore his ACL at that point if you're not missing a whole year we trust doctors we trust rehab we're not going to give our medical opinion on this guy we think talent wise that's where he deserves to be but then Jerry Tillery for in my mind, is the best pass rushing defense tackle in this class after Quinn and Williams. The most pass rushing moves in this class, and I don't think he's going to be a great run defender, but again, you don't need to be a great run defender as long as you're solid in that regard. What he can do as a playmaker, what he can do in the passing game is that valuable, in my opinion. Yeah, he can get after the QB. We're seeing, uh, I've seen him in the late first. I've seen him uh, in the second round in, in various uh, big board rankings and, and draft boards and all that. So um, the, we're the certainly interesting thing him. with him is I've seen consistency being noted as a knock on him. And yes, early in his career, that was certainly the case this past season, though. Game in, game out. He was disruptive. There weren't games he took off while he had like a majority of his sacks in the Stanford game, he had a ton of sacks in that game and didn't have sack production consistently throughout the year. He was still pressure production for, you know, in our grading, very consistent. Yeah, you know how I I don't love the consistency mm-hmm. argument because yeah. we have every snap. And if the grade still comes out on top, then yeah, you're then probably you were, you were okay, like yeah. we talked about last week. Uh, the, the two cornerbacks, that's, I said we'd be a little bit higher on some than others. Greedy Williams and Byron Murphy. Uh, Greedy Williams from LSU, Byron Murphy from Washington. Uh, we have Murphy at six, Williams at nine. Um, again, I don't know that we feel like they're... You know, it's it's tough to say that they're slam dunk corners, but they're good enough. The value uh, in the top ten makes a ton of sense. Uh, other people have them more at the bottom end of the first round. Greedy Williams' grade wasn't as great this past year, um, but I think I tweeted this out recently. When you just look at our three year grades, um, and that's uh, what I, I love about the database that we have now is mm-hmm. we've got these guys' entire career um, taking the last three years. It's DeAndre Baker from Georgia, Byron Murphy from Washington, Greedy Williams, all very close to each other in overall grade. Um, very different styled corners, but guys we're all going to say are going in the top 10 or top 10 players in this draft. Yeah, the Byron Murphy to me is he's the best quarterback cornerback in this draft. I think he's the or safest cornerback in this draft. I could foresee someone being better down the line, but he has the uh, you know the change of direction ability that you love at the cornerback position. The athleticism checks all those sort of boxes. Yes, he's undersized. May not be a press man corner, but zone still, you know, zone and off coverage is still what you'll see more uh, of any coverage at the NFL level. So I think any sort of scheme that's zone heavy, he is your guy. He is your top corner on your board because he's so good in off coverage, so good at breaking on routes that I think that just that automatically translates to the next level. That sort of instincts and athleticism translates to the next level. So many plays where he just plays with his eyes on the QB, and that's, um, yeah, it's very much going to be scheme dependent. I like Greedy Williams as a press man corner. I like Murphy in zone, like you said. Like DeAndre Baker, maybe is the best hybrid of the two. Uh, you mentioned Tillery, and then Andre Dillard. I don't know if we're higher on him than others. I've seen more mid first round type stuff for him, but a guy that's been excellent in pass protection at Washington State, and we know that's the most important thing for offensive tackles. I feel like the rest of these offensive tackles, beyond, say, Jonah Williams, come with some question marks when it comes to pass pro, and I think that moves Dillard a tick above some of the others. Yeah, he has a handful of different sets that he utilized at Washington State, very adept at all of them, and has the best first punch of any of these tackles in this draft class. Super long arms, just stones, stone walls pass rushers in their tracks. And he just didn't have, even though he had gave up a handful of pressures this year, some of them came on stunts, just didn't have any ugly, ugly reps that some of these guys did. He pretty much never gets himself in bad positions as a tackle, you know, never really ends up whiffing for air. So for that reason, I think he's the best 
It's the second best tackle in this class after Jonah Williams. And then Dalton Reisner, a guy that we're still higher on than most, but I think between Dalton Reisner and Jawan Taylor from Florida, uh, Reisner, of course, goes to Kansas State. Between those two guys, I feel better about them in the run game than in pass protection. My only question with Reisner is, you know, was he, he wasn't really challenged in the Big 12, had some ugly reps at the Senior Bowl, even though overall he was pretty good. Um, I really, really want to love him because the production was outstanding, but you kind of have to adjust it because of the Big 12. Yeah, he just he doesn't have the foot speed that the other guys have on this list. Jawan Taylor, Dillard, Jonah Williams. He just doesn't have that sort of quicks. And on the edge, he was holds up great against power. I mentioned the Montez Sweat game before, how he so won strong. that matchup You know, in a powerful, long edge rusher like Montez Sweat, who's getting first-round hype himself. Wins that matchup, but if he go when he goes to Senior Bowl, sees some guys with quicks, all of a sudden he looks like a fish out of water. Quickness is going to give him an issue. Teams may see him as a guard. I think he still hold up a tackle, but uh, that's why he's a notch below these guys. One our- other guy I want to mention, Will Greer, the quarterback from West Virginia. Is this your upside quarterback in the uh, in the draft, Mike? Oof. Is I love you team? saying upside there because, With again, no one knows what it means. Guy. Literally doesn't have a big arm. No one else would call him an upside quarterback, but he's accurate, and it's been accurate at you know all levels of the football field in our quarterback charting and as you said the analytics point to those being good indicators of NFL success so we think you know he has upside oh he has this because he's accurate at throwing a football but still there are question marks and I go back to the senior bowl which he just it was bad I don't want to overrate the senior bowl senior, I know like, you just you come to perform there it's more of a pressure it's more how you react to the pressure of this situation being your biggest job interview yet and he did not react well and just to compare to to what baker mayfield did last year the whole like tick every box Mm -hmm. uh concept baker did that you know his off field uh what other people called antics we looked at it and said man that type of confidence looks great senior bowl baker played well Mm -hmm. everything else played well so if you're Will Greer grading well in our system, if we saw that good week at the Senior Bowl and he just kept ticking every box yeah. along the way, you'd feel a little better about him. But um, I still think maybe if he's a back end of the first, if you're talking about the Saints, well, the Saints don't have the first round pick anymore, but the Patriots are looking for their next guy to develop. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't mind Will Greer as that guy if I'm a team looking to develop someone, um, maybe more than I would want Daniel Jones, and you know who yeah. looks like an upside quarterback. Well, again, because bigger. you go to all the quarterbacks who have been late rounders developed into you know elite or high level quarterbacks tony romo uh tom brady those sort of guys do they have cannons like even dak would it, even dak, dak yeah, as a would, fourth rounder did they have very strong arms and all of a sudden figured out how to throw accurately no figure, they're yeah, accurate I, and all of a sudden figured out how who are the guys that have done that where are right. the logan thomases the christian hackenbergs the guys who Hack, uh, uh, not we're not picking on Hack again. Okay. He doesn't even have a big arm. But I, but I the guys that had big arms that figured it out late. Mm-hmm. Exactly. The John Skeltons. <laughs> that was John Skelton. Oh, Cannon. Gosh. No idea where it's going. Yeah. Guess what happened in the NFL? Cannon. No idea Still where it's up. going. All right. Which guys are we lower on? Because um, we have some unique draft boards. Um, a lot of our stuff's going to look a lot like everyone else's because you know, good football players yeah. generally rise to the top. Um, but we definitely have some guys way lower than other people ex- are expecting. But there are also going to be a lot of guys who are just volatile prospects who some people like and don't because, you know, depending on the game, but they're just inconsistent at the moment. And when you're inconsistent in college, some people are going to see the game where you played poorly and some people are going to see the games where you played well and say, oh, you know, I can harness that well. Some people see the games they played poorly and say, oh, that's what he's going to be at the next level. We sort of – we take the grades more the breadth we have all the games so we say oh he, over all his games he wasn't that good that's why we're probably lower on some of these well, guys you, so you weren't here last week but sam and i went pretty in depth about what we do versus traditional scouting and that yeah. basic concept i thought we that that was a fun little mm-hmm. discussion about you know the four game sample the six game sample yeah. versus us having every single snap and so rashawn gary is kind of the poster boy for that in terms of you see reps on tape where you think oh my lord like he picks up offensive tackles off the ground sometimes oh, if he can do that every single time, he's worth a top five pick. Yes, if he can harness that, he's worth that top five pick that he's being rumored to go. But the amount of times he does it, the consistency with which he does it, is not even close to being willing for us to invest top five pick. He's you know later in our top 50. If and when he crushes the combine, mm-hmm. does that change your mind on him at all? No, it's again, it's your point. You're about to say it, I know. Don't check athleticism twice. Don't. You know, yeah, and I'm not. I'm not yeah. trying to. I'm you not trying to saw it on you, t- but you already saw the athleticism on tape. Right. It's not gonna. If you know, if if we're gonna look at athleticism at the combine, there are certain positions where it matters a little bit more. Mm-hmm. There are certain positions, you know, if if a corner runs a four eight, 
you know you're gonna you're gonna do a double yeah. take on him if an edge rusher puts up ridiculous numbers you might go back and try to you mm-hmm. know talk yourself into him I just want to see if are we going to talk ourselves into Rashawn Gary and um, you know our valuations aren't final but um, we see him more as a second round type of prospect I, I don't see myself changing my mind on him and putting him in a first round mock over these next couple of months even if he breaks no I mean like I've watched all his snaps from this past season and I just could not feasibly get on yeah. board with him uh, Daniel Jones another guy that we're higher on he's not making our top 50 initially um, I don't know if he'll break it. We're going to probably have him as an early third round type of player. Um, when when we talk about developmental type of players, I don't think he's um, he's not inaccurate to the point where he's broken or anything like that. He's he is inconsistent from snap to snap. And when we do talk about developmental prospects, uh, the thing I will say for Daniel Jones is we've seen him get better. We've seen him take this step. He's still fairly young, um, and he has some NFL type of tools. So I don't think. Again, using Hackenberg as the extreme example, I don't think this is a Hackenberg, you know, unfixable situation. Mm -hmm. um, But I think the Daniel Jones risk of trying to get him to become an NFL quarterback is a good risk in the third round rather than the first or second. Yeah, exactly. If you're taking him in the top 15, you're saying he's starting for you for two years. Is you, you know, if you're taking him t- first round, right. again, like there's only been a handful of first round quarterbacks that haven't started at quarterback for the team for multiple seasons and haven't made it all the way through their, you know, rookie contract with the team. It just rarely happens. But when, so you're forcing a guy who you have major concerns about into a starting role right away, it just doesn't seem like that's going to work out. That's why we're saying third round is where uh, he might not even see the field over the course of his rookie contract in the third round. That's where we'd be more comfortable uh, developing a guy like that. That's where I liked a guy like Mike Glennon a couple mm-hmm. of years ago. And I think he went third round. So. Yeah. yeah. But, but there, were, but there right was, there was first round hype for Mike Glennon at mm-hmm. one point. He's a guy that put together some reasonable starts. Yeah, at and one that's point. the thing. And you that's hope a, that you just can increase that consistency. And I think that's where that's a third rounder is worth uh, a backup quarterback who can come in and maybe win you a game when your starter gets yeah. hurt play some adequate football like a Nick Foles that's worth a third rounder yes that's worth a third rounder that's where you should draft those guys you shouldn't just push them up all of a sudden because oh you know Nick Foles won a Super Bowl now oh those guys are not all of a sudden more valuable no they're not they're still not worth the first rounders all right a couple of the guys that we are lower on Ed Oliver we're going to have right around 22 of course he's still getting top 10 hype I think people are souring on him enough that we're, we're well I think those are merging our takes yes. versus the community's take uh, Greg Little, I think his stock's really been all over the place, depending on who he's another talk, guy who's been all about, over the place. Yes. To. Uh, Drew Locke, he's getting top 10 hype. Mm-hmm. We're going to have him bottom end of the first round um, just because he's he's a step below Haskins in our world. And um, again, there's um, let's let's just say this. There's a breadth of uh, outcomes, essentially, in player evaluation and not just college to pro. But NFL year to year, mm-hmm. you know, like when a, a player is something year one, there's a range of outcomes the next year for what he's going to be. He's not going to be the same exact guy from a production standpoint. He'll be within a range, right? The Drew Lock range is just way lower than we like to see. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like a small percentage chance that he hits this high end and a much bigger percentage chance that he hits this below average NFL quarterback range, which is like, all right, when do you really take that? Yeah, I, I completely agree. The quarterback value aspect, or the quarterback where you draft quarterbacks, is a very interesting conversation because uh, we always say, you know, quarterback's so much more valuable, quarterback's so much more valuable, but it's a position where you don't want to be, like, just having an average quarterback is not actually that valuable. Like, it, it's not necessarily, even though it might be worth more wins above replacement than Aaron Donald, the 13th best quarterback, might be worth more wins above replacement. Uh, you can't you can't get to you can't get a defensive tackle that's even close to Aaron Donald. Yeah, you don't uh, want to saddle you know, yourself to that exactly, quarterback, right? Exactly. So that's what I'm getting. So, at. It's difficult to sort of parse that out. So I would say lock. So in a perfect world, lock is the guy for again. I'm using the Patriots as an example, but you could say the Saints if they had the pick. The team that's looking to have a guy sit, um, even if the Steelers don't believe in Mason Rudolph, do they want the next guy to mm-hmm. sit? see who the replacement's going to be for Big Ben, whoever it is, the, the Chargers, the next guy for Phillip Rivers, right? Um, I feel like Drew Locke's in that range where if I was one of those teams and he's a he's a, like, say, an average quarterback and you can try to develop him because mm-hmm. there still is a chance that he could develop. Mm-hmm. It might be low, but, but it doesn't – but you're not tied to him. Yes. Right? So you want to give him a chance. So, like, if Andy Dalton had a chance to just, like, maybe become elite – 
as a, <laughs> while he's while he's sitting behind someone. I'm just using an example, yeah. right? Yeah. You would you would take that chance. Mm-hmm knowing that you could always get the next guy. You know, it's a tough, yes. it's really a tough Like Andy place Dalton to went where he should have gone. Yeah, he did. I think and, so. and that's where quarterbacks like that should go uh, because, one, they don't always hit, and two, when they do hit, it's not exceptionally so, high end. I thought Geno Smith, right? So the Jets mm. took Geno Smith in the second. It was their third pick of the draft. They had two first rounders and then drafted mm. Geno Smith. And even though Geno Smith didn't pan out, I thought it was, a, I thought it was an excellent use of a draft pick. Yes. Right? You say, oh, you lost your second round pick, but that is the type of risk reward that you might want to take on a quarterback in the second. They were never truly tied to him as the starter. You just see what you get, and then you move on if you have yeah. to quickly. But I feel like the whole conversation about quarterback value, passing game being so much more important, is pushing the guys that used to go there in that range just pushing them higher up. Right. So Drew Locke will very potentially go top 10, mm-hmm. as people say. All right, two Mississippi State guys that were lower on Montez Sweat on the edge, Jonathan Abram at safety. Um, I think both guys just had issues from a production standpoint. Sweat, I mean, you're really low on him compared yes, to others, and you're our, uh, you're our edge defender guru here. Yeah, so I get he has long arms. I get that he's fairly explosive for his size, but that only gets you so far. Offensive tackles in the NFL are very strong and very big and have long arms. You have to they have do. something else to be able to scare them, and at this point, I don't think Montez Sweat has that something else that scares me. Yeah, it, look again. If you haven't, if you haven't rushed the passer at a high level in college, on a snap for snap basis, we've rarely seen the jump at the next yeah. level. And he had that one rep at the Senior Bowl that everyone highlighted. And again, it was just a bull rush through a college offensive tackle, and even a you know, smaller college. It was Ty- Tyus Howard, the Alabama State guy. So he's not even close to uh, you know NFL level at this point, NFL ready at this point. No. That was his one rep, and even just in terms of his win rate at Senior Bowl was not that good in the one on ones. No more one play scouting. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sweat most recently in Mel Kuyper's mock draft, number five. To the Tampa Bay Bucks. I think that would also no, be, that would be you. too high. As far as Abram goes, I think he's another like a Rashawn Gary. He's made uh, Feldman's freak list. Mm-hmm. He's really fast. I feel like he could be the guy that he didn't grade well for us. He had two exceptional games in the grading. I think we can maybe post something about that in the future and show how like his high end. Mm-hmm. But overall in his career, did not grade well. But I could also see him in that Keanu Neal role where he just plays this simplistic, simplistic, it, strong it. safety role where he uses that, his athleticism and flies to the ball. So I think in the right scheme, maybe you get something out of him, but I'm not ready to put him in That's the fair. first round like some other people are. And then let's just discuss from a running back standpoint, the top running back on our draft board, by the way, to the dismay of George and Eric, mm-hmm. the fact that we put him even this high, Josh Jacobs from Alabama, who's getting top five hype as well, top 10 hype. And we've put him at 41. So this is one of those, Mike, where we're going to get we're going to get trashed by normal football people for putting our top running back at 41. And then we're going to get trashed in the building by our numbers guys for putting him as high as 41. They're Mm -hmm. like, no, put him in the fourth round. Don't care how good he is. But Josh Jacobs is a very good running back as a player. He's very good. But then again, it comes down to you can take Josh Jacobs. And uh, well, I've seen him top ten. I've seen him, right. you know, mock to the top ten. You can take Josh Jacobs there. You'll get a good running back. We believe is a good running back. He has receiving skills as well. But then you could also get David Montgomery at fifty, or yeah. Devin Singletary, Devin Singletary at sixty. You get one of those guys there. Far less investment, and the incremental difference is negligible. Right. You know, David Montgomery after the after the catch is absurdly good. He broke 23 tackles a couple of years ago on only 36 catches. He is great in space. He's our the most elusive running back we've seen. So uh, that sort of difference in, uh, in talent ability or difference in production that you'll get from those two just does not warrant drafting guy that highly. Yeah, and if you guys want or more information on why we hate running backs, I thought Eric Eager did a really nice job uh, writing about Zeke Elliott because everybody's asking about our Zeke grades this year and there's a difference between our grades and value Mm -hmm. but even the grades were lower because he had six fumbles which is absurd for a running back that's way too high that pulled him down quite a bit but even when Eric dove in through the numbers there actually wasn't anything special about him as a running back compared to what his run blocking was so the point we try to make is I think Zeke is an extremely talented running back there is a difference in running back talent but it does not always come across in running back production that is Mm -hmm the biggest issue the difference in talent does not match the difference in production that's the simplest way of saying running backs don't matter where everybody likes to Mm -hmm. get this extreme running backs don't matter thing that's what they're saying there are a lot of guys who are big and fast and elusive 
Yeah. There just are a lot. But there's also slow guys. There's just not a lot. Who, if the run blocking is good, will get also, five, yeah. mm-hmm. right? And that's 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 the other issue too. Is you're also dependent on your yeah. on your surrounding, uh, you're on your surroundings more than other positions. That's the whole running back argument. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a few more minutes here. It's going to be a, a, a quick one today because we're going to be going live. Or yes. almost live. Mm-hmm. Live to tape, as they call it in the industry, on Sirius. Don't forget, Mike and I, on Sirius Radio, every Friday night on the NFL channel. That's channel 88 from 7 to 9, uh, discussing a Prime lot time. of this same stuff. Um, there were a couple things in the Mel Kuyper mock I just want to run by you quickly. Mm-hmm. You've got Rashawn Gary at 4 to the Oakland Raiders. We keep saying this is the one that shows up in everybody's mock draft that I think would be yeah. a mistake. Obviously, we just talked about Gary. Montez Sweat at five to the Bucks. We think that might be a mistake. TJ Hawkinson to the Lions. We like Hawkinson quite a bit as a player. You detest tight ends in the first round. I mean, in the top ten, they're really risky Lions because fans know why I detest tight ends in the first round because well, you draft Eric Ebron, Ebron over Aaron Donald and let him walk and he gets yeah. fifteen touchdowns. Yeah, that one's just not happening. I'll just say. But what about the Lions passing on a cornerback? I mean, they need to start with that pass defense first and then work forward. Greedy Williams, DeAndre Baker, Byron Murphy, not necessarily all of them, but Greedy Williams I think would be yeah. a great fit. Well, yeah, as a cornerback or pass rusher. Yeah, obviously, in this draft, they went a lot of pass rushers early and they didn't have one, but they have to address one. Of, there's gonna They have to address one of those two positions because, one, the value's going to be there, right. and two, it's such a huge need. I think it's going to be one of those. Very risky if they're taking a tight end. Mm-hmm. And then um, the Buffalo Bills at number nine, he, he, he goes with DK Metcalf. So Metcalf's a guy that we said, look, the production doesn't match the hype, but the more we watch him, he'll probably end up with a first-round grade from us. Um, he does do first-round type of things. Oh, man, I... I could see this would be an interesting one to the Bills when you talk about helping out Josh Allen, his deep mm-hmm. speed, and Allen's ability to get the ball down the field. I wouldn't hate this pick for the Bills, DK Metcalf. Yeah, I think he's a better version or what they wanted you know, Calvin Benjamin to be. When you have someone like Josh Allen, I think you want a sort of jump ball, contested catch receiver because he's not going to, even on his deep balls, he's not going to be hitting you in stride right. every time. You're going to have to adjust a little bit for Josh Allen. He's got a big catch radius. But like yeah, but radius. DK, Matt, DK Metcalf has that and has speed and has strength to win at the catch point. Kelvin Benjamin did not have a vertical jump. Kelvin Benjamin could not get down the field fast enough. Oh, you know, so for even. So, Kelvin, so this is not even a debate here. I, I do think, though, this class offers a lot of those type of players. If I'm the Bills... I'm not. Sh- I'm sh- I'd rather address that on the wrap in the second round than right there in the top ten. Because again, defense is this draft's strength. Um, I know they have a great pass defense in Buffalo, and mm-hmm. everybody wants to rebuild the offense. But Byron Murphy, as a zone corner, going to that zone yeah. scheme opposite Tre'Davious White, and then Would maybe circling back in the second, third round and stocking up on playmakers, whether mm-hmm. it's wide receivers, tight ends, whatever it is, I think would be a fantastic strategy yeah. for the Bills. It's like you can't. Who doesn't want a better pass defense? I get being like a very no, good pass too many defense, corners. but who doesn't want being better at pass defense? You can never, you can literally never have too many corners. Correct on your team. All right, man, it was a quick one today. It was, um, but you know that was our draft board. Check it out over at ProFootballFocus.com. It'll be up uh, early next week. Next week we're all going to the NFL Combine. We're gonna have a ton of fun content coming out of there. We're bringing the cameras. I'm going to be recording some of the stuff behind the scenes. We have meetings with all 32 NFL team clients. We're going to try to bring you guys some of that um, as much as we possibly can. We'll do some daily recaps and all that fun stuff. Our combine week is a little bit earlier than all the workouts, but we'll try to get get you guys behind the scenes on some of that. We'll keep the podcast schedule. Uh, I'll be back here Monday with Sam, and uh, you and I are going to go do some serious radio right now. So tune in if you guys, um, you know, every single Friday night, seven mm-hmm. to nine, the PFF show. Like I said, turn around at the bar. Turn out the bar. Yeah, ask, the ask them to do it. Yep. All right, and everybody will listen. We'll be we'll be famous. Well, you're already. Thank you. The number fifteen bachelor and a, a model. So thank you. Can you tell me? Can you tell everybody what you're doing Monday nope. night? No. Let's just keep going. Let's end the show. How much of your life am I allowed to tell the public? Not not any of that. All right. All we right. won't tell anybody. That's it. We'll see you guys on Monday. Thanks for tuning in.